What's up, y'all? This is Zach with Living Corporate and a bit of a different message today as I think about my own career, I think about my own experiences and really like why Living Corporate exists or, or at least why I had the initial unction to like create this. I think about I think about the fact that I have always been told um, how well-spoken I am, how articulate I am. Um, I think about fifth grade where I was voluntold to read uh, a speech from Martin Luther King. They made a whole program where I was the keynote speaker. Didn't even, didn't even ask me. They just told me. There was another situation where I was called to read uh, a thank you letter for uh, a crossing guard that was retiring. Didn't ask me, just told me because I make them look good. I made the school look good. I remember being told constantly, you're one of the good ones. I recall um, being told that I act white and I recall being told to, to take that as a compliment. And somewhere along the lines, as I continue to grow and get older, um, and just like as many people in college do, discover parts of myself, discover parts of my blackness that I didn't necessarily appreciate in my younger years. But um, still, as as pro black and, and those things as I would have claimed to be back then, um, there were still parts of me that internalized whiteness, uh, internalized being better, uh, internalized being accepted and approved by white people. And I remember after I quit my job at Target um, and I was working at Cameron International, which has since been acquired by Schlumberger, but I was working there and I was the only black man um, on the corporate level, on the corporate floor. I was a contractor. I was making $66,000. I'm going to tell you, $66,000 when you're 22 feels like a million dollars, (laughs) right? Anyway, I'm making this money and I'm a contractor. So for those who don't know, you're a contractor. You know, one of your goals, depending on, you know, your your background, um, you know, you want to go permanent because permanent means or full time means that you get benefits. So I was making sixty six thousand dollars a year with no benefits, but I was younger. So I could still I was on my mom's insurance. Right. Um, the challenge And what I realized was that I really wanted to be full time because I just, you know, it's a class thing, right? I felt like, man, I'd really be accepted. I'd really be part of the club. And I remember working. I was working, you know, 14 hour days, right? Like I was working. I mean, anything they asked me to do, I was doing it. They asked me to get coffee. They asked me to drive to Louisiana to do a presentation. They asked me to write something for somebody else. They asked me to, you know, do anything, right? I mean, you know, again, I'm I'm 22, 23 years old. I'm, I'm ghostwriting messages for the CEO at the time. I'm um, speaking on behalf of the company. I'm coordinating events in Brazil. I'm talking to folks in China. I'm talking, I'm coordinating events in Australia. I'm doing all types of different types of training and strategy. I'm meeting with all these different people. Like I'm, I am on the floor. I am out here, right? Like I'm actively, you know, it's a, it's more than a, a dog and pony show. Like I'm really working. And I recall at the same time I was pursuing uh, now my wife and everybody knew that people had met Candace, right? They knew her. Uh, they knew that I was contract. They knew I wanted to be full time. They knew that I was looking to buy a home and I was looking to, you know, take the next step in my life. They knew all of these things. And I asked several times over like, hey, what's the process? Like, what can I do? Applied for a couple of roles, found out that, you know, there were people internally who were blocking me, telling me to not telling folks to not hire me. Um, I remember doing everything I could. I remember like code switching very heavily. I remember, again, just going above and beyond every single day, like trying to work within the system to get the things I wanted to be a, a notch higher than I was um, in this system. And I'll never forget two weeks after the wedding, plenty of people um, wished me well. 
I took no time off because I didn't have time off because I was a contractor. So we didn't have a honeymoon. I remember my my supervisor was like, Zach, you got to take a time off. And I said, well, based on how my life is set up right now, because I'm a contractor, I can't do that. If I'm not going to be a if I'm not going to be made a full time employee, I can't take time off. I will take time off at the end of the year when I have to take time off because it'll be Christmas. Right. Um, and so I remember. After the holiday break, we were just getting back right to work. And again, this wasn't too long after I got married, maybe a couple months. But I remember being pulled into my supervisor's office and being told that my contract was ending because Cameron was going through an acquisition. And I remember in that moment, I didn't have time to even be angry because I was like, yo, okay, I'm married. Like I have a responsibility. I got to figure this out. But I remember just feeling betrayed and deflated and disillusioned because here I am. I did all the things right. Right. Like I, I dressed the part. I spoke the part. I shrunk myself. Um, I worked crazy hard. I asked all the right questions. I made myself overly available. Like I was the I was the ultimate resource uh, for them to leverage and use as they needed to. And I was willing to um to be that right to exhaust myself without complaining. And yet I still got no reward. Now, mind you, there were white folks next to me left and right who were getting hired straight from Texas A&M full time jobs. Right. They were getting hired to full time jobs. I would ask about, hey, like, can I get into the what's this program or this pipeline? They would say, oh, do you even do you even graduate from college? Do you just have a GED? How'd you even get here? Actually, hold on. Why are you even a contractor here? Right. I was like the biggest nuisance to some of the people in that organization. And I was just genuinely trying to survive. And so I share this story to say, like. Whiteness will not save y'all. You know, some of you like have like who are listening to this black and brown people like. Your story is similar to mine, but you just so happen to go a little further. Maybe you got your promotion or maybe you uh, were converted to a full time employee or maybe, you know, you got whatever. And so, you know, you feel as if because you're one of the only or because you made it so far that you're good. But I'm telling you that whiteness will not save you. And these systems are built and they're designed um, for people that do not look like you. And so it's important, like as we talk about like living corporate, as we talk about um, identity and inclusion and belonging. That we don't forget that you are who you were when you got here and no one's forgotten that you are who you are, even if you've forgotten Um, It was the most humbling and like harsh slap to reality that this same group of people who said we're a family. And yes, we know you're married. Congratulations. And all these different things turned around, hired a bunch of people all around me. And cut my contract because they cut off. They cut all the contractors contracts. Right. Because that's part of like the acquisition. When you're when you're acquired, like they start cutting because they're like, okay, well, no, we're about to merge. So, like, we're going to let these contractors up like everybody was getting let go. Right. Um, And it's it's challenging. I mean, even and I'll say this, too, is like living corporate exists for folks who feel stuck because there were moments in that season where I applied to a lot of different jobs, a lot. I applied to a lot of different jobs and it was tough. It was tough getting that job like it was. It was hard getting an interview, um, but I interviewed a lot of different places and we get to the final round and it just got passed over at the last minute. Right. And I could feel the pressure because contract work is it's decent money. Again, for me at the time, it was cool. Um, It can be decent money. But like when you're grown, like if I had been like 28, 
Like that would have been sca- that would have been even scarier. Right? I just want folks to realize that like you putting on whiteness, it may shield you for a season, but it will not save you. And it will not give you the solace and peace that you're looking for. And it is not the disguise that you think it is. It's not. It isn't. And so my encouragement and the reason I shared this story is because I really want us to stop trying to um, sit at the top of systems that are not built for us and instead use our courage and our imagination to think about new systems that can serve all of us. Um, So much of DEI today is like just diversifying capitalism. It's figuring out how to put new black and brown figureheads at the at the table of clubs that have been not only exclusive, but malicious and harmful to marginalized people. And y'all like, that's not progress. That's not radical. That's not revolutionary. That's just same old capitalism. It's exploitative. And I can't tell you the amount of people that I've spoken to who are like older, right? They're in their forties and fifties and sixties who look back and like, man, I really, I wanted to do more man. I could have done more or they carry the same frustrations that like a 20 something year old person may carry. That's discouraging, right? Like that's discouraging. We owe it to ourselves to want better and to think outside of our immediate comfort and to reject fear and think about new systems, right? Like you have options. You can either seek to lead the systems that exist, or you can seek to design new systems that will actually serve us. But those two options do not coexist. So this is a binary choice. You cannot choose to want to sit at the head of these harmful systems and claim to be a revolutionary or claim to be radical or claim to be about equity and inclusion because these systems have proven themselves to be inequitable and disinclusive and outright exclusive. So if that's what you're about, okay, but realize that that does not coordinate, that does not jive, that does not square with equitable and inclusive systems for everybody. Okay. Uh, Whiteness won't save y'all. It won't. And the sooner that you can love yourself by returning to yourself and discovering who you are. And I'm telling you, if you're listening to this and you're black and brown, I'm going to tell you what you are not. You are not white. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And that's okay. It's a beautiful thing. The trauma and the, and white supremacist systems imposed upon us is bad. Your non-whiteness is not bad, right? So love yourself enough to be yourself, whatever that looks like. And whatever it looked like, it won't be white. I love y'all. Talk to y'all later. Peace. Living Corporate is brought to you by The Break Room. Have you ever felt burnt out, depressed, or otherwise exhausted by being one of the onlys at work? You know what I'm talking about. Hosted by black psychologists, psychiatrists, and PhDs, The Break Room is a live weekly web show in the Living Corporate Network that discusses mental health, wellness, and healing for black folks at work. Name another weekly show explicitly focused on mental health, wellness, and healing for black folks at work. I'll wait. This is why you got to check out The Break Room on livingcorporate.tv.